All right, I wanted to talk about something that's been on my chest for a while. It's been eating me up inside for the past few weeks, and I've decided that this needs to be made public. I know that I might lose a lot of respect for what I'm about to say, and I want all of you to know that I'm very sorry that I did not make this known sooner. So, here it is. I used to love Johnny Test. Johnny Test follows the misadventures of an 11-year-old with flaming hair who acts as a lab rat for his genius sister's inventions that often go wrong. His dad is a stay-at-home cook, his mom is a workaholic, his best friend is a talking dog that's named after crap, and he's the nemesis of a million different villains. If you've never heard of this show before, then it may just look like another disposable cartoon, but Johnny Test has had a presence unlike any other cartoon that I've seen. It's a show that's both popular and hated. It's been very successful, yet whenever it's talked about, it's almost always in a negative light. Despite the quality of the show itself, I've always felt that there was something especially strange about it. Today, I've rewatched a majority of the show, including all the episodes that I've never seen, and looked into its history and development to wrap my head around how a show like this lasted for six seasons and 117 episodes across three networks over nine years. Johnny Test is the creation of Scott Fellows. He's got quite the resume, being the man behind over 30 Fairly Odd Parents episodes and being the creator of Nickelodeon live action shows like Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide and Big Time Rush. He's been a pretty busy guy, sometimes working on two or three shows at a time. While nothing he's done has been really incredible or groundbreaking, I do enjoy quite a lot of it. Almost all of his Fairly Odd Parents episodes are pretty good, and while I haven't seen Big Time Rush, Ned's Declassified may just be my absolute favorite live action show that Nickelodeon has ever produced. Though it was basically just a live action cartoon, so that's probably why I liked it so much. The same year Ned's Declassified premiered, Fellows pitched Johnny Test to Warner Brothers Animation, and the show premiered on the Kids WE block on the WB Network the following year. However, there's a lot of history behind this show that few really know about. According to a reported lawsuit from TV veteran David Staten, who sued Fellows for apparently not crediting him as the co-creator of Johnny Test, the show was developed in 1995, but wasn't picked up until a decade later. If this is to be believed, it negates the common criticism aimed at the show that it's a ripoff of Dexter's Laboratory. Personally, I never really got the comparison. They both focus on families with a blonde doofus and red-headed geniuses, but the connection doesn't really go further beyond that, and both shows feel completely different both in comedy and tone. Dexter's Lab was always more focused on the characters rather than the inventions, while almost every Johnny Test episode revolves around the villain or invention of the week. Plus, Dexter's Lab first premiered in 1996, meaning that the concept would have been drastically changed for Johnny Test to truly be a ripoff. Another thing that interests me is the trailer that was used to help pitch the series, which surfaced online not too long ago. It's composed of clips that would become the first episode of the series, Johnny to the Center of the Earth. Here, the animation and art direction are very rough, surprisingly even worse than what the series would have later on. There's also a lot of details that would be later changed, like Bling Bling Boy is called Golden Boy, and Dookie was named Poochie. I'm really glad they changed that latter name looking back on it, because whenever I think about a talking dog named Poochie, all I can think about is this. Catch you on the flip side, dude masters! Not the full pilot episode has been confirmed to exist, but currently this pitch trailer is all that we have. I'd love to see the original pilot someday, especially since it was produced with a mostly different American voice cast instead of a Canadian one. I don't think that this pilot is going to ever become the holy grail of lost media anytime soon, but I hope it services eventually. But now, let's get into the first season of the show, which premiered alongside Coconut Fred's Fruit Salad Island. If anything, that was a sign of good things to come. Season 1 of Johnny Test is one that I think of as not what it is, but what it isn't. The seasons that follow this one shaped how I viewed the show, and compared to that, this season looks like the Black Sheep. People tend to hold this season in pretty high regard when looking at this series as a whole, and while season 1 is nothing especially great, it's still a fairly enjoyable cartoon. The humor has button fart jokes here and there, but there's still a lot of funny bits of dialogue, and you can tell that the writers were a lot more self-aware of what they were doing. Like only a couple of episodes into the series, Dookie is already making fun of Johnny's overused catchphrase. I 
know, I know. You didn't see that one coming either. Episodes follow a loose formula, but all of them feel a little different, whether it's a really creative invention or the episode itself is just very weird. This season was strange in a very jarring way sometimes, like with the episode where Susan and Mary trick Johnny into destroying the future for no reason, or when Johnny and Dookie find a seemingly perfect alternate universe when they shrink down to a molecular size. These episodes are the most creative that the show got, and as bizarre as they are, I find them to be some of the most entertaining for that reason. Johnny Test's art style is reminiscent of early 2000s Cartoon Network shows like Time Squad and the digitally animated seasons of Powerpuff Girls and Dexter's Lab, with characters that have hard outlines alongside softer and not as complex backgrounds. At times, you can tell that they didn't have the biggest budget, but there's still a lot of fluid little touches, and I like how they were willing to change the art style when need be. With the backgrounds, they even do the thing that the original Powerpuff Girls did, where the background characters aren't really drawn the same way twice, which is a nice detail in the art direction, and something that probably took more time to implement than just sticking to a set of regular extras, though some of the background characters definitely could have used another design draft. This season is a lot less hyperactive compared to the others. The characters don't scream as much, and we're directed to speak a lot more softly. The music, while not being anything special, can really help set the tone. And for the only time in the series, you actually get the sense that there's a bond between the characters. Johnny hardly acts like a jerk to the others, and when he does, he's punished for it. There's even an episode where Johnny tries to get back at a couple of nerds after they make fun of Susan and Mary's inventions. I couldn't find any major problems with the season as a whole, besides a minor one with some of the music. The original theme song is alright, but the main guitar riff that the show uses for transitions is ripped straight from the beginning of Bastille Day by Rush. Why they didn't get sued for this is beyond me. This season looked to be a promising start to a pretty cool series, but before Johnny Test was given a chance to build upon and improve what worked, the merger of the WB and UPN into the CW caused the show to suffer budget cuts, and production of the series was taken into the control of Cookie Jar Entertainment. The show was now being produced by practically new staff, with only the creator, voice actors, and probably a few other not as important people returning. Johnny Test was now in the hands of my nemesis to the north, Canada, and many changes were on their way. And it began with the theme song. Someone must have looked at it and said, Hey, instead of ripping off Bastille Day, let's just rip off American Idiot by Green Day instead. No one's gonna notice. From here on out, Johnny Test is the exact kind of cartoon that I hate. Formulaic nearly beyond belief, irritating at every turn, a visual eyesore, and a general waste of talent. That's not to say that the show lacks any sort of positive qualities from here on out. If there's one thing I have to give it credit for, was that it was fairly creative from time to time. I can recall so many of these episodes pretty clearly just off of their concepts, like the episode where penguins basically took over the world, the one that began with Johnny's woodshop teacher cutting his hand off, or when Johnny got fat and started his rap career. I'm Johnny, Johnny, I used to be thin, maybe a bit scrawny, now I got a big butt and my thighs are kinda body. I'm Johnny, Johnny. If you have any memories watching this show, you most likely remember a handful of episodes. And while most of these are nothing special, it's better than being completely forgettable. Seasons 2 and 3 of Johnny Test are the ones that solidify the show's new tone and style, while also introducing characters and cliches that would be used for the rest of the series' run. But the show falls apart when it comes to execution. This show is so loud and in your face in every way. Not only did the characters scream a majority of their lines, wasting some pretty good voice talent, but Johnny Test has also got to have the worst sound design that I've ever seen in a cartoon. Every single joke and every single act is highlighted by an obnoxious music cue. The audio never gives the show any room to breathe, and it's especially irritating when it cycles through the same 15 or so cues throughout a season. The music is by no means catchy, but it's so overplayed that it began to get stuck in my head the more episodes that I watch. The music can also really affect the quality of some scenes. Like, I can't take the scene where characters think that Johnny died seriously, when the music that played during that scene also played when the characters encountered a talking blueberry that stubbed its toe. On the topic of the music, they also changed the theme song to the aforementioned American Idiot ripoff for season 2 and onward. I kind of prefer the second theme song just because I find it more memorable, and unlike the show's other theme, it doesn't just repeat the same exact phrase for a quarter of its runtime. Both theme songs have the charm that most of the 4 kids themes have, where they aren't very good as far as songs go, but man are they catchy and memorable. The writing of Johnny Test tries to be very tongue-in-cheek, like it'll make a lame joke and point out how lame it is, but instead of laughing about how stupid the joke is, you aren't laughing because the joke is just stupid and not funny. The whole show tries to get its audience in on the joke, but ends up coming off as lazily written instead. 
Not only is the comedy written this way, but so are the plots. To solve a conflict, the characters almost always just pull something out of thin air, or pay something off that was previously foreshadowed in a half-assed way. I'm jumping ahead a little, but you can see this in action in the Season 4 episode Johnny Get Your Gum. All the kids in Pork Belly are sent a package of Helio Bubble, gum that sends them flying into the sky when bubbles are blown with it. To save the town, Johnny figures out that he can combine his sister's superpower gum with the Helio Bubble to create a solid and bouncy gum that the kids can safely land on. And when I say figure out, I mean he guesses and just turns out to be right. They try to make this a bit of a suspenseful moment, but it doesn't work because we already saw Johnny combine the different gums earlier in the episode. And when Johnny did combine them previously, they didn't even have the same effect. It seems like they had a good idea of how they wanted to resolve the episode, but they just executed it very poorly. Speaking of things that were executed very poorly, the animation has received a major downgrade, as the show is now animated in Flash instead of being traditionally animated. The reason why I'm constantly impressed when I hear that shows are animated in Flash is because this show set the bar very low for me. The characters themselves snap into every pose that they make, and while the character models themselves can be pretty expressive, they just look stilted whenever they aren't given anything to do. I'm not a big fan of how the backgrounds are done here either. Some are well detailed, but they all lack depth, and sometimes it looks like characters are standing in a place where they should the show really has a shot that looks visually interesting, and the perspective is almost always that of a straight-on shot. The show uses a revolutionary animation technique called hitting Control c and then Control v until the entire screen is filled with characters in hope that no one notices. Now, I would usually be pretty hard on a show for having animation like this, but it makes sense considering that Johnny Test officially became a Canadian show in its second season. From what I understand about Canadian content laws, Canadian TV and radio networks are required to air a certain percentage of content related to the country. These laws explain why a lot of shows produced by Canada's main original cartoon channel, Teletoon, are so cheaply produced. And the same applies with Johnny Test, though it's clear that plenty of talent still went into the show. The storyboards are way better than the final product, as they're so much more expressive and lively than the finished animation. It's a shame that at this point, the show didn't have a budget to do them justice. Additionally, to get the job of animating the second and third seasons of the show, Kaleidoscope Animation pitched Warner Brothers a reanimated clip from the episode Johnny X, done in Flash. The clip is really faithful to that of the original, but it took a team of animators a week to create 30-some seconds of animation. The clip shows that the Flash team was indeed capable of making animation nearly on par with Season 1, but they more than likely didn't have the budget to. That's not saying that the animation we got was complete garbage, because it's still got a few nice details to it, like movements that emulate traditionally animated smear frames and some very good visual gags from time to time. Like in the episode Johnny Kart Racing, the mayor pushes the news reporter Hank Anchorman off screen, and when he does that, he pushes his banner headline off with him. It's very surprising to me that a joke as subtle as that made it into such an unsubtle show. While looking through some rough animation posted to YouTube, I noticed an interesting detail with one of my favorite characters, Bling Bling Boy. It is I, Bling Bling Boy, here to impress the lovely Susan Test with one million roses. Get her for me! Here, you can see that all the spots on his bling that would usually be silver and shiny were digitally green screened in. My favorite thing about this is that in almost every single piece of promo art of Bling Bling, they forgot to add the bling effect, so his chains are just green. I just wanted to share that piece of trivia I found. The season 3 finale, Johnny X A New Beginning and Johnny X The Final Ending, were originally meant to be the last episodes of the series, as they featured Johnny's superhero alter ego going up against nearly every major villain from the show. Honestly, I think it would have ended the series on a pretty decent note. I mean, the episodes aren't perfect, but they are pretty entertaining, even if they do end with Bart saving planet Earth. But as it turns out, the show was only one third through its run, as the show would go on for 78 more episodes. If you thought these episodes were mediocre, then just you wait, because Johnny Test was about to enter into a whole new era. Stand back, citizens, for it is I, Johnny X! Hey, it's James Arnold Taylor, the voice of Johnny Test. Mom, since this morning, I've jumped over a shark moat, had an aerial dogfight, and survived a TV-style car chase, and I'm fine. While recording the voice of Johnny is a huge part, there's also writing the script, animation, music, there's a lot that goes into creating it. But there's one thing that really makes the show. Okay, that is enough! I can't imagine the show without that. joke about Johnny Test overusing the whip sound effect a lot, and honestly that complaint is pretty justified. You can practically take any clip from Season 4 and beyond and hear the whip sound effect be played over a dozen times within a minute. 
Uh-oh, Johnny. Looks like you've got a severe beating in your future. Oh, no. Future me has been too awesome to get a beating. Follow me, Dookie. No one knows why Johnny Task used the whip crack sound effect so much, but if I had to take a guess, it was used to mask the poor snapping between animation poses. But more likely, in the universe of Johnny Task, the whip crack is just a regular part of speech. When is the next bus to Bikini Bottom? What? The bus schedule, the next bus. I can't understand your accent. The final three seasons of Johnny Test only have minor differences from the first three. One of the bigger changes is in the animation, though not by much. Due to the closing of Kaleidoscope Animation in 2008, the show switched over to Atomic Cartoons for providing its animation after season three. The change in animation is nowhere near as major as the one between seasons one and two, and you probably won't even notice it if you aren't looking for it. The animation feels more automated and lacks the occasional polish found in Kaleidoscope seasons. There's a lot more recycling of character models and backgrounds, some of which can feel rather out of place. Like, why is the hotel manager from the episode Johnny Test in 3D in line to buy Gil's house in a later episode? I also spotted a few minor animation errors, like Johnny's dad switching outfits between shots here. Yes, the animation is passable for the most part, but I can't really give the animators the benefit of the doubt for at least trying their best when there's so many missed opportunities. Like in the episode Johnny Alternative, Johnny and Dookie travel to a gender flip version of their universe, and Johnny basically falls in love with himself, which is surprisingly kind of a recurring theme in the series since his rival Sissy is basically a gender flip Johnny herself. Around the same time this episode came out, Adventure Time did their first Fiona and Cake episode. Say what you will about those episodes, but so much creativity went into making most of the designs of the gender swaps look different from their counterparts. In Johnny Alternative, all they did was change some of the characters' facial features to look more masculine or more feminine and then called it a day. I know the design and animation team probably didn't have a lot of time for this or any of their other episodes, but they still produced a lazy and slightly disappointing product. The only part of this series' art direction that remains somewhat consistent in quality are the title card. Their style did change a little every season or so, and for some I just don't know what they were going for, but all of them are pretty well detailed and colored, especially in the later seasons. These title cards don't really make the show better, but they are the only part of it that I can say are actually good without making a sarcastic or negative remark afterward. When it comes to good things on this show, I'll take what I can get. Season 4 is probably the most creative and memorable of all the seasons outside of the first. There's a lot of diverse episodes episode concepts here, like Johnny's dad trying to get his son a sports scholarship, Johnny accidentally traveling to North Korea, and Johnny getting a wart that mutates into an alien parasite that tries to take over his mind. A lot of these episodes still don't live up to their absolutely quality premises, but I still found things to like in many of them, like a good joke or two. Why did you resist a police officer? Why are you police officers? I blew up Malaysia. They also did an episode about Johnny trying to basically become a YouTube star, and despite it being produced in 2009, it's actually pretty accurate today. Johnny tries his best to become a success, but the videos with pranks and brutal animal attacks do way better than his by accident. It's weird how well this episode has aged with the landscape of YouTube having changed so drastically over the past nine years. In fact, outside of a few episodes, Johnny Test is pretty timeless. Though pop culture did make its way into the show in another way, but I'll get to that in a bit. However, season 4 is also when the show started to go overboard with its racing and parody episodes. The racing episodes had the cast competing in some kind of race, like kart racing, the amazing race, boat racing, lawnmower racing, lawnmower racing, dog sled racing, race wars, and Mario Kart racing. As you can obviously see, these episodes got more and more original as they went on. At first, these episodes were a good excuse to get all of the characters together, but they ended up constantly repeating a lot of the same themes and jokes. Like, they were almost always kicked off by bet between Johnny and his sisters, or a snob challenging them, the villains always tried to cheat, Johnny always pushes a lot of buttons on his vehicles at work when it's convenient for him, and either Johnny wins or everyone but the snob wins. They basically wrote the same episode six times, and only once or twice was it actually any good. But there's also the parody episodes, where the show takes on a famous movie or TV show by copying its famous moments. To disguise the fact that they're just ripping off something more successful, they have Johnny say, I'm telling you, I've seen this somewhere before. Later on, you can tell that they were starting to run out of things to parody, because then they had episodes where they made fun of themselves, where literally no point about the show was made whatsoever, and in the episode where they parody Johnny Quest. I understand why they do this, because Johnny Quest sounds like Johnny Test, but speaking as someone who has seen some of Johnny Quest, that show isn't nearly as memorable as some of the other things they lampoon, like Scooby-Doo or Pokemon, so that episode really fell flat for me. Around the time Season 5 started airing is when the show seemed to get rather popular down here in the States, since that's around when they started to pump out merchandise that was on par with the quality of the show itself. I just so happen to own a few incredible Johnny Test items, like the DS game. 
a high-octane adventure with beautifully animated cutscenes, thrilling level design, and great references to the show, like these turkey enemies that never appeared on the show before. I also have DVD sets of the first four seasons with great touches, like using art assets with different styles that don't mix together on the covers, and storing all the discs in individual plastic sleeves instead of actually storing them inside of the DVD case itself. I have no idea why all DVD cases don't hold their discs this way, because this is so much more convenient! Anyway, Season 5 marks the debut of the second most notable change in the series. They redid the animation for the theme song in Flash, which does not look very good, and added whip crack sound effects to it. No, the real change came in Dookie's voice actor switching from Louis Cirillo to Trevor Duvall, due to Louis apparently retiring from voice acting in 2010. And uh, do you know why you had to replace it? Oh yeah, yeah. It's it's nothing. Um, it's nothing dramatic or anything like that. It's basically, right. Louis uh, fell in love with this woman from Brazil, I believe, and decided to move to Brazil. But there was a problem, something to do with his BC residency or his citizenship or something, because Louis is both American and Canadian, and I believe. Uh, in order for him to work in Brazil, he had to get his Brazilian citizenship, I think. I think Canada only allows you to have two citizenships. So he had to give up one. So he gave up the Canadian citizenship so he could maintain his American and and his Brazilian. But as soon as that happened, he was basically no longer eligible to work on the show. The change bugged me when I originally heard it many years back, but nowadays I find it similar enough to not be too big of a deal. It's called chaos, and you need to stop it because you're the director. Oh, if you hit your head harder, a concussion and a cool ambulance ride will take away the boredom. While I'm on this topic, Mary actually had two voice actors that she swapped between three times in the series. Brittany Wilson in seasons one through five, and Ashley Ball in seasons two, three, four, and six. Whenever one of Johnny's sisters gave out exposition, usually Susan was the one to give it, and that combined with how inconsistent it was across the entire series made the constant changes with Mary's voice problems that I got over even quicker than I did with Dookie. But Johnny, you cannot abuse this machine. This dial sets how many newtons of magnetic force an object will have after you zap it. Do not exceed 5,000 newtons of force. We have to save Susan, and the general, and the Nautabago, but mostly Susan. When I was re-watching these last two seasons, I started to ignore a little problems like that, and I just kind of accepted the show for how dumb it was. Like in the episode Johnny of the Deep, there's a gag where Johnny watches an old TV show called Aqua Dude. And later in the episode, when he and Dookie are turned into sharks, they meet Aqua Dude and he's watching Johnny Test. I could complain about this joke not making any sense, but it's Johnny Test. That's just the kind of show that it is. Watching the show like this didn't make it better. I just accepted that the quality of it probably wasn't going to get any better from there on out. There were still episodes that bug me, like Johnny and the Beanstalk, probably my least favorite episode that I can recall. Not only does it have a kind of forced message about eating healthy, but the plot makes a little sense, and the show tries to explain that by literally saying that it's a cartoon. The giant's treasure is a Choco Chopper! Okay, that was convenient. Again, it's a cartoon. Go with it! I can't tell if that's supposed to be a snarky fourth wall break by how casually the line is read, but it's some of the laziest writing I saw in a show filled with it. Season 5 continued the annoying trends that came to the forefront in Season 4, but also had a few of its own. In Season 5, there's a couple of episodes that feel like they drag on for way longer than they should. The episode Roller Johnny has Johnny and Dookie being turned into women to win a roller derby. Yet for some weird reason, Johnny turning into a girl was actually a recurring theme on the show. After they win, Dookie gets amnesia and thinks that he actually is a roller derby champion. The episode feels like two separate plots were stitched together, and it really could have benefited from a little rewriting. By the start of season 5, Johnny Test had done 130 segments, so it's no wonder that around this time, the writers began to suffer from a bit of a creative burnout. Some of the episode titles even reflect that. The quality of the episodes remained roughly the same, but the concepts became a little less original, and more and more episodes took previous concepts and did them a little differently. This problem applies with season 6 too. This reminds me a bit of Spongebob Season 9, where some episodes felt like they stitched together a bunch of other ideas from previous episodes. Though here, the episodes are a bit more distinct and don't feel like total rip-offs. Some episodes recycle concepts to the point that they kind of ruin the effect that they had. There are so many episodes where the tests go to Bling Bling for help that it started to feel like less of a twist and more like a trope. Still, there were some entertaining episodes here and there, like Frank and Johnny, where Johnny and Bling Bling's limbs become detachable and they steal each other's bodies, and Johnny's super new mega villain, where the mayor almost manages to defeat both the Tess and all of the main villains of the series, and that's why he's at the top of my Johnny Tess character tier list. 
Season 6 also has a couple of episodes that try to expand upon certain parts of the show's world, which was pretty rare to see up until this point. In fact, at this point the show's world kind of felt like it was shrinking, as more and more minor characters were starting to disappear. Anyway, A Picture's Worth a Thousand Johnnies is about the family trying to take a family photo to replace a picture that's been in their living room in almost every episode of the series. And then there's the 100th episode, where all of the characters tell stories about first meeting Johnny to wake him up from a coma. Despite the concept being more than a little unoriginal, this is probably my favorite episode. Not only because it has good world building and feels very satisfying if you've been following the show for a long time like I have, but it also shows that Johnny has a heart, which is easy to forget with how much of an annoying jerk he can be. The series finale, Johnny's Last chapter was about Johnny and Dookie getting sucked into a history book and having to find a way out. It wasn't the best episode the show had that could have acted as a possible final episode, but it was still better than an Earth Day episode with a forced environmental message because it wasn't an Earth Day episode with a forced environmental message. Who even thought it was a good idea to make an Earth Day episode with a forced environmental message? After that episode, the show was over. A seventh season was announced in mid-2013 along with a three-part special, which I think would have been cool to see, but the season was never produced. After season 6 finished airing, Johnny Tess basically left Cartoon Network after that point, and everyone behind the show moved on, but it still left quite a legacy behind it. Johnny Test is the worst character ever. This is the worst Cartoon Network show ever. Not only that, this is the worst show ever! Johnny Test began airing on Cartoon Network in early 2008, and I believe that its success there in the States was what gave it the momentum to keep chugging on. I found an old promo highlighting the various shows that were premiering on the network around that time, and besides Flapjack, all they had were Robot Boy, George of the Jungle, and Chop Sucky Chucks. Yeah, maybe people that said this era of Cartoon Network from the late 2000s is better than what we have today should reconsider that thought. Eventually, when Cartoon Network slowly but surely stepped up their game, Johnny Tess still stuck around, and it ended up as one of the network's weakest offerings. Around this time, people started complaining about the show online, through video rants and some of the greatest hate art to be posted on the internet. In some ways, the hate for Johnny Test is bigger than the show itself, and to an extent it's kind of continued to this day. For this reason, I think of it as probably the most hated cartoon ever. Even shows like Teen Titans Go! have its fans, but I've never actually met anyone above the age of 12 that unironically liked Johnny Test. I still see people calling this the worst show that Cartoon Network ever aired, and after reevaluating it, I really don't agree. Johnny Test was a lazily produced series with some talent and good ideas behind it, but not enough to make it a very good show. Its transition from an American to a Canadian cartoon stunted its potential, and made it tough for a good product to be made within the production guidelines of the country. Despite its flaws and how mind-numbing it can be to watch, I still saw that there was some effort put into it, and people really tend to forget that when looking back at this show. When people think of Johnny Test, they think about the things the internet has blown slightly out of proportion. They say that Cartoon Network aired it and promoted it too much, when each season only got one or two advertisements, and I never thought that it took the spotlight away from another new show that needed it more. They also say that the show used the whip crack sound effect too much, and okay, that point is valid, but I remember so much more about the show. I remember the characters, I remember the jokes, and I sure remember Bling Bling Boy. He truly was the series' golden boy. I'm Bling Bling, I'm Bling Bling, you can tell it cause it says it on my ring ring. Got mo style, ain't no pest, gonna keep rabbit hard till I get to the day. In my eyes, this isn't really a show that is held up. Every part of it was clearly made to pander to 10 year old boys, and I no longer enjoy it to the point where I actually want to buy its merchandise. But despite that, this show stuck with me after not having watched it for half a decade. And for that, I think it deserves at least a small fraction of my respect. But still, I give Johnny Test a 5 out of 10, since at the end of the day, this is still Johnny Test. Personally, I find the show to be kind of a guilty pleasure, but I wouldn't really recommend that you go out of your way to watch it, especially with there being other cartoons that use a formula similar to this show, but do it way better. This show may not be on Cartoon Network anymore, but it's been on Netflix for the longest time, which is good since it's the exact kind of show that you play in the background while you're trying to do something else. Right now, you can also find illegally uploaded full episodes of this series in the recommended section of this video, because pirating a show is okay when the show in question isn't very good. It also has an active Facebook page with over 2 million followers that regularly post memes using clips from the show. All I can say about that is that I hope the person managing it is happy with their life. Then there's Scott Fellow's most recent cartoon, Super Noobs, 
which is basically just Johnny Test again but with anime transformations. It no longer assaults my ears, but it does assault my mind with questions of why it even exists. Super Noobs didn't catch on the same way that Johnny Test did in America, and is moving to Hulu for its second season, much to the excitement of 2016 me, who thought it was the worst thing ever when I reviewed it two years ago. Looking back on it now, I really don't know why I was so angry at that show in that video. I guess I just might have been afraid that it would go on for six seasons like Johnny Test did, but so far it doesn't look like that's going to be the case, or at least I really hope it isn't. Part of me also feels like Johnny Test might get some kind of reboot in a few years after Super Noobs ends, even though no one wants to see that happen. Kind of like that weird second season of George of the Jungle that was produced nearly 10 years after the first. I think that the show is still recognizable enough that executives might still see money in it and give the series another shot, but we'll have to wait and see if Johnny Test has any sort of future ahead of it. Now that you've made it this far into the video, you're probably wondering, why did I make this video? Why did I decide to make it the 75th one I've done? Was this video just a big joke? And what is the meaning behind the no Razars poster in Johnny's room? All I know is that I wasted basically a month of my life making a nearly half hour video on Johnny Test. I really didn't see that one coming.